Well, I'm going to speak a little bit from Zechariah chapter 10. There's two verses there that are significant, but I'm just going to kind of use them as a springboard into a, a key thought. Uh, Zechariah was one of the restoration prophets. Um, he, um, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi were instrumental in giving direction to the restoration, the little remnant that came back from Babylon after they went into judgment. And um, they were faced with a huge building program, right? They had to build the walls of the city, and um, they were going to rebuild the temple. And when you read that story, you find that when they came back, they faced all kinds of opposition. Uh, I believe it's like Ezra chapter 4 or so. You can read about all of the even political opposition that came against them and delayed the work. So for many years, the temple sat unfinished. But the Lord began to stir the hearts of the people to press through and accomplish everything that he had brought them there for to complete the work. <clears throat> and so that causes us to understand a little bit of what Zechariah is going to prophesy. And in chapter 9, he prophesied that there was going to be an increase. The Lord was going to strengthen them. Uh, there was going to be rejoicing and so forth. And uh, so he goes on. We're going to continue on in chapter 10. He says, Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. You know, seasons are appointed by the Lord. He, uh, as we heard just a moment ago, he has a timetable. And when we think of the seasons um, in the natural, which, you know, we, we think of the four seasons, but, you know, the significant thing to this agricultural community was how that related to crops and planting crops and preparing fields and then harvesting and then laying up for the, the winter season, that kind of thing. So he's, he's basically using that to say, you know, when it's time, when it's the right time for that last rain to come, then you need to ask the Lord and he'll make bright clouds. This word bright clouds actually means, uh, you know, thunderstorms, lightning, flashes of lightning. <clears throat> so when it's the right season, pray that the Lord would, would uh, bring the necessary rain. And Isaiah 55 and verse 6, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call ye upon him while he is near. And it's the same concept. When, when it's time for the Lord to move, seek him. But I was just meditating on Isaiah 55, 6, to call upon him while he, he can be found and while he's near. And it came to mind the response of people that were desperate during the ministry of Jesus. For example, blind Bartimaeus. Uh, he knew Jesus was coming, and so he, he just cried out, oh, Son of David, have mercy on me. Then you think of the woman who had the issue of blood, and she pressed through the crowd, and he was passing by. I mean, uh, when I read that story, I have the sense that she had this all plotted out. He's going to come by, and I'm going to be in this position, and then I, you know, I am going to touch him. I need healing. And uh, she got her healing. So it was key, wasn't it, for them receiving something from the Lord that was necessary for them. So call upon him while he's near. So that's one way we, we consider this. But also, you know, there are times when God will call us uh, from our routines to, to seek him. It's time to meet with him. And he'll just make it clear that he's, he maybe is bringing to your life or to the church a time of prayer, a time of seeking the Lord. And that is borne out in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, uh, verses 2 through 6. And this is the, the Shulamite, the woman, speaking here. And she says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved that knocks, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. 
until she hears the call. And her, her thought is, and this is her thinking, I have put off my coat. Uh, you know, I'm already in bed. How shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Uh, so she is going through her routine, and she's being called to break her routine and meet with the Lord. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door, and I was moved for him. Um, my affections were stirred for him. And so I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, and of course, you read on, you find that she missed that opportunity, that she opened the door and he was gone. And so she looked for him and she couldn't find him. So it further emphasizes this verse, uh, this truth in Isaiah 55, 6, call on him while he's near and while he can be found, call on him. You know, we have to pray for the outpouring, going back to our, our original text. Uh, Zechariah is saying, when it's time for the rain, pray for the rain. And he's prophesying to a group of people that it was time. It was time to press through and, and lay a hold of everything God had spoke. And so he's saying to them, it's time to pray for an outpouring from the Lord. He's speaking in natural terms, but it's, he's, it's spiritual. It's not natural. He's not saying pray for rain. He's saying you, you need to pray or something from the Holy Spirit. We'll explain that in a minute. You know, Elijah, the days of Elijah are really uh, symbolic of the days that we're living in uh, because they were the days of Jezebel. And when you read in Revelation, you find that Jezebel is mentioned several times. It's the spirit that she represented, uh, the spirit of seduction that comes over the land and this is the environment that Elijah was ministering in. The whole nation had gone after idolatry. And, uh, you know that he brought judgment on the prophets of Baal. And he declared that there was going to be uh, a famine in the land for three and a half years, which is a significant number. So there was a drought. There was no rain. They, they couldn't even find hardly hay for the horses to keep the horses alive. But... <clears throat> then the Lord speaks that it's time for rain. And so in 1 Kings 18, uh, verse 42 through verse 44, it says, So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees in, in this position of travail, and said to his servants, Go up now and look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said again, go again. And he did this seven times to a servant. Go look out over the sea. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there is arising a, a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, <clears throat> Elijah said to a servant, go up and say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get down to your house so that the rain doesn't stop you in your travels. This is going to be a, a mighty outpouring. So here we have this situation that speaks to us a spiritual truth, that we have to pray for the rain when God calls for rain. It wasn't a matter of Elijah simply saying, God says it's going to rain. God said it's going to rain. Elijah declared it, and then he went and travailed until the rain came. So what's the significance of the latter rain in Zechariah 10 when it says pray for the rain uh, in the time of the latter rain? Well, the church of the Lord, his church, is to ask God for the blessings which it needs to flourish. You know, that latter rain was the rain that came and just gave the plants uh, what they need to go to maturity and have an abundant harvest. And we're to pray that the Lord, when he's moving us forward, we're to begin to pray that the Lord will pour out his blessing uh, so that we have what is needed to accomplish his work. That we need the, the blessing that we need to flourish. 
And then also, you know, the rain speaks of the anointing. It speaks of the Holy Spirit. And we need to ask the Lord for a significant outpouring of the Holy Spirit that brings us forward. You know, when we're saved, we're given a, a token of the Holy Spirit. We're given a portion of the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us Jesus was given the Holy Spirit without, uh, what was the phrasing that was used? Without measure, yeah. He's given the Spirit without measure. Well, we've been given the Spirit in measure. So, but what we see in scripture is that, you know, it doesn't end with that little, the new spirit that the Lord puts within us. We're to cry out for greater and greater um, portions of the Holy Spirit, the, the fruits of the Spirit developing in our life, the gifts of the Spirit functioning in our life and in the church, uh, the seven spirits of the Lord coming upon us in those uh, needful times, and for revival. Uh, a revival is a significant outpouring of the Holy Spirit, an exceptional outpouring of the Holy Spirit that pushes his church forward and especially in a time when there's languishing, right? And we need to pray that the Lord will, will give us the Spirit in, in, that, in that way. It's not a wrong prayer. We can obsess on revival and so forth, but it's not a wrong prayer, and especially in the days we're living in. When there's languishing, we need to cry out for uh, an extraordinary outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will move us forward anointed preaching, uh, the repentance and conviction, the fear of the Lord poured out, uh, the gifts of the Spirit beginning to flow in the church, the fruits of the Spirit developing, uh, power to evangelize as well. That's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit is poured out in an extraordinary way, all of those things happen in the blessing of the Lord, and it, and it pushes God's people forward. Um, and so, you know, we're to pray for the latter rain, the rain that, that brings the harvest, right? And we're to seek the Lord for the harvest. It's not because we want numbers, we want a big church, you know, but it's because we love the Lord of the harvest. And when you read the Song of Solomon, you know, Solomon is called the Lord of the harvest. He's a type of Christ. And it says in uh, the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and verse 11, that uh, Solomon had a vineyard in Balfour, and he gave it to the husbandmen. He gave it to the vine keepers. Um, he gave his, I think it says that he gave his vineyard unto the keepers. And the symbolism there is that Solomon represents Christ, and the keepers are the church. The vineyard is the church, and the keepers are his servants that are ministering in the church. And so, you know, there was to be a harvest. The Lord has uh, gone, ascended back up to the Father, and he left the responsibility of the church to his keepers. And he wants a harvest. It's to the Lord's glory that his house is filled, right? And we want to see his house filled, not because of numbers, but because we want to please the Lord and bring in the harvest that he's looking for. It's interesting, I was looking back over some old, say old notes, uh, 2017 when we first came here, and uh, the first Wednesday uh, that we had a little exhortation, I made a statement that God was preparing a vine that could bear the fruit. That was something that was spoken over the church at the time, that the Lord was preparing this vine so that it could bear fruit. And I believe the Lord's been doing that. And I believe that there's a time of fruitfulness mm -hmm. for us. And we need to pray that the Lord sends rain to bring the harvest, right? Mm -hmm. To bring the harvest. And I was just uh, reading, uh, Charles Finney came to mind because he was, he's sometimes called the, the father of, a, of American revival. Uh, He's the great revivalist. And I, I want to read a little part of a little article here that um, I was looking at earlier. 
But it says here that Finney seemed to have the power of impressing the conscience of men with the necessity of holy living in such a manner that produced lasting results. And this is a quote, over 85 in every 100 persons, in other words, 85%, uh, the people professing conversion to Christ in Finney's meetings remain true to God. That's incredible. Whereas 70% of those professing Christ in meetings of even so great an evangelist as Moody afterward became backsliders. In other words, it was just they were caught up in the moment and, you know, they, they weren't apprehended, truly apprehended by what they were doing. But Finney had these incredible, this incredible, through his ministry, people were deeply uh, convicted and, and turned to the Lord and to holiness. 85% uh, remaining. That's a, quite an incredible thing. But he goes on to say that such results were the fruit of hours and hours of prayer. It was not Finney's prayers alone that secured such heaven-sent revivals. Finney's was supported by the prayers of two of God's hidden treasures. It was the hidden yet powerful intercessions of Father Nash and Abel Clary that laid the groundwork for these mighty moves of God. Abel Clary was converted about the same time as Finney and was licensed to preach also. And I just, I get a kick out of this. Uh, him and Finney, you know, they go through the same preparation. They both get their minister's license. But of Clary, it says... He had such a burden of prayer that he could not preach much. <laughs> uh, it just goes to show you how the Lord uses people differently. Uh, he wasn't good at preaching because he, he was so moved on by the Lord in prayer. His whole time and strength was given to prayer. He would writhe and groan in agony, unable to stand under the weight. After Clary's death, Finney discovered Clary's prayer journal. Finney found in the exact order of the burden laid upon Clary's heart was the order of blessings poured out upon his ministry. It's incredible. Father Nash lived a life of almost continual intercession. He joined himself with Finney, kept a prayer list, and was no doubt the secret of much of Finney's marvelous success. He did not preach and often did not go to the meetings but remain in his room or in the woods, wrestling with God in mighty prayer. Often before daybreak, people could hear Father Nash for half a mile or more in the woods or in a church praying, and the sense of God's presence was overwhelming. So there you have it. I mean, we talk about Finney and the great revivals, and, uh, but behind that was people that were praying. Uh, and it was the prayer that brought the rain, right? And that's really something that we have to remember that when it's time to seek the Lord, we need to seek him. That's the key to having the latter rain. Uh, every revival or every time of increase in a church is preceded by a time of seeking the Lord, period. That's how it is, and that's what we see over and over again historically and in the word of God. And so, you know, the Lord wants to bring us increase. We're, we're moving into increase. He's doing it right now. And uh, we need to give ourselves to prayer. And uh, uh, in, in Hosea 10, it says that it's time to seek the Lord until he come and rain his righteousness upon you. Until he come. In other words, we're to persevere. Just like Elijah did. Those seven times praying until... Uh, they could see the cloud and they knew that rain was coming. And we're to pray that there's going to be a harvest for us. You know, there, there are so many souls, I've said this before, people are, are getting sick of the deceptions that they're being fed. Uh, right now, it's a lot of it's politicized, uh, but people are getting tired of believing a lie. And I believe that we have a part in reaching the people that are going to turn from the deceptions of the kingdom of darkness and that are looking for the truth. We're going to have the truth. In Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 2, the next verse, it says, uh, you know, pray that there'll be rain. 
For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they, meaning the people that were deceived and lied to, went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. Uh, it's interesting, uh, this little expression, they, they went their way as a flock. That they went their way actually in the Hebrew means to pull up your tent stakes. They got tired of where they were living. They pulled up tent stakes and said, we're going somewhere else. Uh, and it says they, they did it like a flock. And that, that the thought there is of migrating from one area to another, just a mass migration. And uh, so we want to pray that the Lord will do that, that he'll anoint us. He'll bring the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He'll anoint us to um, be able soul winners and to have the power of God so that when we speak, there's power behind what we say, right? And it goes on later in Zechariah 10, in verse 8, it says, For I will hiss for them or whistle for them, these sheep that have are migrating. I will whistle for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them. And they, the church, shall increase as they have increased. Right? This is our prayer service, so I like to bring up subjects regarding prayer and I hope that this will put a vision within us. Um, this is a real crucial time that we're in, and we want to pray that the Lord will pour out an abundance of blessing that, that gives us what we need to prosper, and we want to pray that he'll bring an increase of souls as well. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's looking for a harvest.